Welcome to the Bioneers, revolution from the heart of nature. What does it mean to call something sacred? To talk about the sacred in nature is to say that all beings have a right to exist, and more than that, all beings have a right to prosper and to experience joy. That is at the heart of the sacred. It's all alive. It's all connected. It's all intelligent. It's all relatives. Scientists tell us that concern with the environment will no longer be one of many single issues in the next century. It will move to the center of the stage. It will become the context of everything, of our lives, our businesses, our politics. We are, in fact, moving from the information age to the age of biology. In this series, The Bioneers, Revolution from the Heart of Nature, we salute the Bioneers, the biological pioneers who are working with nature to heal nature, reducing the human footprint, honoring native wisdom, and restoring the earth by changing the world. The machinery of the human enterprise savagely rakes the forests, oceans, flatlands, and mountains, obscures the sky, mines the earth, and leaves our burned trail of trash, slicks, and radiation as the time legacy of Homo sapiens. We've heard the litany for decades now. We do care that we've lost the in our bones knowing of the intimate interconnectedness of all, that life beyond me and what is mine can carry such small value today, point to nature's demise as the symptom of a mass psychological crisis. How do you address a global psychological break as dangerous as this? To slow the bleeding, many have responded by dedicating their lives to nature conservation, restoration, ecological education, community building, and environmental justice. The core pathology remains. Now world leaders and grassroots activists are talking about the ecological crisis as a crisis of spirit. It's a dialogue that has been worked around native campfires for millennia. Some say that if we can change our consciousness, we can change the world. That spirit creates nature and nature creates spirit. One is infused with the other. Join us for the next half hour as we explore nature and spirit, it's all connected. With author educator Matthew Fox, Rabbi Michael Lerner, founder editor of Tikkun Magazine, and deep ecology writer, Buddhist scholar, and general systems theorist, Joanna Macy. My name is Michael Toms, I'll be your host. Welcome to the Bioneers, revolution from the heart of nature. The 13th century theologian Thomas Aquinas defined spirit this way. He said, spirit is our capacity to relate to the totality of things, our capacity to relate to the totality of things. In the Native American tradition, this would be put simply all our relations. It's at the level of relation that our hearts are opened and that spirit flows and that everything takes on a sense of sacredness. Matthew Fox, an ordained priest since 1967, is a visionary theologian and founder and president of the University of Creation Spirituality in Oakland, California. His books include Sins of the Spirit, Blessings of the Flesh, and The Reinvention of Work, A New Vision of Livelihood for Our Time. He spoke to a Bioneers conference audience. What does it mean to call something sacred, to talk about nature as sacred? Well, sacred perhaps has many synonyms. I want to throw out some, some of my own here. What is sacred is precious. What is sacred is precious. It's special. It's not easily repeatable. What is sacred is something that is beyond us, that is bigger than us, greater than us, something something we aspire to. Indeed, what is sacred is that which charges us with awe, inspires us. What is sacred is a given, it's a gift. It's a blessing, it is a, a grace. What is sacred awakens wonder in us. It brings us back perhaps to our deepest experiences when we were young of unity 
and of wholeness and feeling connected to the whole, connected to all that is. What is sacred floods us with gratitude, floods us with gratitude so fully that we overflow. And so we have in our language the words thankful and grateful because gratitude is a fullness in us that overflows. It is bigger than us again. Rabbi Heschel says this about wonder. He says, wonder is an act in which the mind confronts the universe. All it takes to wonder is one plant, one animal, one pair of eyes looking at us, one tree, one stone, one story. If our hearts are sensitive and yearning to be alive again, then wonder trips us up and brings us back to that primal state when as children everything was new and everything was amazing. And we were struck by what Heschel calls radical amazement. Says Heschel, this is an insight we gain in acts of wonder, not to measure meaning in terms of our own mind, but to sense a meaning infinitely greater than ourselves. That is what wonder produces. It produces meaning, and a meaning infinitely greater than ourselves, than our own agenda, than our own anthropocentric agenda. So it seems to me that to talk about the sacred in nature is to say that all beings have a right to exist, and more than that, all beings have a right to prosper to their own happiness and to experience joy. That is at the heart of the sacred, the experience of joy. Recently I received a letter from a woman in Colorado who is an activist. She spent a lot of years in prison. And she said she decided she needed a, a sabbatical to do what she called inner disarmament. So she took two years off. She got a cabin in the woods. She was able to get by by working one day a week and lived very, very simply for two years. She says, this is what I learned from listening, watching, and mostly listening in nature for two years. Nature in silence taught me this, that at the core of all that exists, for example, at the core of every blade of grass, hanging icicle, quarreling marmot, beaver, soaring eagle, quacking duck, squirrel, fox, howling coyote, quivering aspen leaf, and melting snowflake, there exists an energy and vibration of joy, not unlike a giggle. And if we wish to take our cues from creation and work in harmony with her, then we too have to be in that energy of joy. I think that's profound advice, and especially at this difficult time that our species, and indeed our culture finds itself in. I want to close with a few words from an amazing man who I've met recently. He's a Navajo artist. His name is David Paladin. And um, he had a very difficult life. At 15, he left the reservation, ended up in the American Army in the Second World War, and was uh, put in a concentration camp for three or four years. When the camp was liberated, he weighed 62 pounds. And he was a paraplegic because he had been tortured there. And um, he was in a coma for two and a half years after the war. His elders said to him, all this suffering has been to make you a shaman. And uh, instead of his going to the vet's hospital where he would have languished for his entire life as a paraplegic, they did it the old way. They took him to a river, an ice cold river, and they threw him in over his head. He said he was angrier at his elders than he was at the Nazis at that moment, <laughs> but it worked. He got better, he, he got his legs back, he actually walked pilgrimages to Mexico, etc. An amazing story. But he talks about the shaman as the spiritual warrior and healer. And I believe that at this time in history, it may be that all of us are called to be shamans and to undergo the dark night of the soul like he did to turn it into power of compassion. This is how he put it. 
He says, shamans are warriors whose wounds become their weapons against fear and loneliness and despair. True warriors are those who take the arrows into themselves. In healing themselves, shamans find strength to reach out and to heal others. They experience their own wounds as gifts and as opportunities. To be truly brave is to lay down all the weapons and stand naked in the midst of the foe, to hear the foe crying and change those tears to laughter. The shaman knows that the wounds are not theirs but the world's, the pains are not theirs but Mother Earth's, the tears are really the purifying rain. So he is inviting us to take seriously, to take seriously the grief, the pain, the sorrow, and the anger in which we find ourselves in, looking at the destruction of the earth today and also looking at destruction going on between human communities. But not to freak out in terms of despair, but to turn this grief into creativity, into power of healing. Thank you. Matthew Fox, the author of Sins of the Spirit, Blessings of the Flesh. Michael Lerner, founder editor of the groundbreaking political, social, spiritual magazine Tikkun, rabbi of Beit Tikkun Synagogue in San Francisco, is the author of The Politics of Meaning and Spirit Matters, Global Healing and the Wisdom of the Soul. Michael Lerner. I um, start with the understanding that I think many of us have that if we are going to save the environment, we need a whole new attitude towards the environment and we need a whole new way of understanding our relationship to the universe. And many people who are in that consciousness have recognized the need for a sacred consciousness. But we're in a mess in the world today. I don't know if you've noticed, um, but we're in the middle of a war, and far from saving the environment, we're building up the capacity and readiness to do more destruction than we could possibly imagine. And that war is something that I think is very important for us to think about in a larger term, not just the specifics of the terrible tragedy of September 11th, but what it means for the way in which we're going to be facing any kind of social change in the future. Because at one level, the struggle that we're going to face for any of us who want change is going to be that off, we have seen with, within two days of that terrible event, President Bush managed to start mobilizing forces for a war. And more importantly, conservative forces in this country were able to re-legitimate their worldview through the prism of what happened on September 11th, through the prism of the terrorists, and to say to people, forget all this stuff about a world built on connection and caring and the sacred and so forth. This is a scary world. This is a fundamentally scary world, and we've got to protect ourselves. And you never know where the danger is coming from. It might come from any place. It might come from your mail. It might come... And so seeing the world through the prism of uh, the terrorists and the terrorist attacks has become the major way in which the conservative agenda has recredited itself. Now, if you look at the higher falutin interpretations of what's going on since September 11th, you'll read over and over again that what we are involved in is a war against fundamentalism. Fundamentalism is on the war path against us because of our wonderful values. And the fundamentalist world is threatened by the freedom and democracy and individual liberties that are uh, part of the American agenda. However, I would like to recast that a little bit to understand that, in fact, if there is a religious war, it's because there are two different contending religions in the world. And one of them is the, what I'll call, corporate capitalist version of modernity. Now, the corporate capitalist version of modernity has within it both very positive and very negative aspects. 
I want to say that if we're going to really understand the struggle going on today, we have to understand both. We have to understand that modernity, particularly Western forms of modernity, brought with it a respect for the individual, a separation of state from church, a willingness to protect the individual from the tyranny of the collective, and uh, hence an ability for each of us to pursue our own vision of what was the good life. That was a really good thing. Those were good things that, the, that Western modernity introduced into the world. But the form of Western modernity that is now being brought to the rest of the world is the form that is deeply associated with corporate capital and its particular agenda. And this is something that most people in the United States have no understanding of because we have no understanding of our actual role in the world. We don't understand that we are 5% of the world's population living off of 25% of the world's wealth. But in the world, that's who we are. That's the force that we are. And global capital has had this impact on the world of accelerating rather than decreasing the dimensions of inequality and poverty. That is one face of corporate capital. A second face of corporate capital's globalization is that in the process of doing this, there has been a widespread disregard for the environment and a willingness to essentially say, well, what we need to do is to protect the environment in our country by exporting environmental dangers to the rest of the world. This is crazy at every possible level because there's only one world. So on the ecological level, it is crazy to think that we can allow the rest of the world's environment to get screwed because that's somebody else. There is only one of us here. Michael Lerner sees the export of global capitalism as the export of a religion of materialism and selfishness. The core value of that religion is look out for number one. In this religion, there is no place for spirituality that can't be presented to one's material senses, be empirically verified, and be consumed in some way. Again, Michael Lerner. In response to that, we get fundamentalist or various forms of religious alternatives that have sprung up in the world today, many of which are just as complicated as what we've had to offer. That is, they have a good part to them because they affirm that there is another reality besides mater the material reality. And they have a very bad part of them because very often what they then proceed to do is to create a spiritual community based on, in part, the demeaning of the other, those who are not part of the community. So that we see right-wing fundamentalism or right-wing religious communities springing up and they provide real community and something that's very valuable for people and a sense that there's something else in the world besides materialism and they value people for something else besides what they accomplish on the marketplace. And yet they do that at the same time by creating a community in which those who are in are in, and everyone else is the satanic evil other. In my book, Spirit Matters, and in Tikkun Magazine, we've been developing what we call an emancipatory spirituality, a spirituality that does not depend on the demeaning of others, but that affirms that there is another way of looking at the world besides the worldview of, of materialism and selfishness that comes from the corporate capitalist religion. We are saying that the center of politics should be the following the demand for a new bottom line in America, or a new sense of what rationality, productivity, and efficiency are. And let me say that the new definition that we are proposing is that institutions be judged efficient, productive, or rational, not only to the extent that they maximize money or power, but also to the extent that they maximize people's capacity to be loving and caring, to be ethically, spiritually, and ecologically sensitive, and to be capable of responding to other human beings and to nature with a sense of awe and wonder at the grandeur of creation. Michael Lerner, the author of Spirit Matters, Global Healing and the Wisdom of the Soul. We're exploring nature and spirit. It's all connected. My name is Michael Toms. You're listening to The Bioneers, Revolution from the Heart of Nature. Finally, we turn to Joanna Macy, a scholar of Buddhism, general systems theory, and deep ecology. She's the author of, among other books, World as Lover, World as Self, and Coming Back to Life, Practices to Reconnect Our Lives, Our World. 
She spoke at a recent Bioneers conference. It's all alive. It's all connected. It's all intelligent. It's all relatives. These words on the back of the Bioneers program, it is a spiritual proclamation. It lays the groundwork for that third way that will guide us between corporate capitalist materialist modernity and fundamentalism. It shows us the way that, that leads us into an emancipatory spirituality. And when I let that in, in this culture that seems at times gone mad to reflect that we're alive when we can say this after centuries of disconnect, that charges me with awe and the energy of joy that after all these years of mainstream thought that has brought us to this impasse, that we are actually taking life, coming into life at this point where that can be proclaimed and that can be our task to know that. Words are not enough. Words are beautiful and words are important, but they're not enough. To walk our talk with others we need our groups. We've learned that in, through base communities, through the consciousness raising groups in the women's movement, through the trainings in the civil rights movement, small groups in which we can learn together, train together, have spiritual practice together, and act together. I think we need these more than ever now. And that they can be rough weather networks where we can vigilantly support each other and watch out for each other so that we can't be disappeared in a country that is increasing police powers, curtailing civil rights. In such groups, we can come so alive in a belonging so intense that the adventure of this present moment is enough we fall in love again with each other, with life. A poem by Rilke to close. He's talking to God, but God is becoming more and more in these poems, identified with the earth itself. And so now he's talking to God as earth, and he says, Dear darkening ground, You've endured so patiently the walls we've built. Perhaps you'll give the cities one more hour and grant the churches and cloisters too. And those that labor, maybe you'll let their work grip them another five hours or seven before you become forest again and water and widening wilderness in that hour of inconceivable terror when you take back your name from all things. Just give me a little more time. I only need a little more time because I want to love the things as no one is thought to love them until they are real and ripe and worthy of you. That is what we can do. That's what we're called to do. And each one of us is created to do that. Each one of us has a distinctive, exquisite way of doing that. There are things that are loved by you better than anybody else. And when we fall into that love, the love of the particular, the love of this breath, the love of that being, that form, then it takes us beyond dependency on visible results. If we're all so interconnected, you know, we can't, each one of us, see the visible results of what we're gonna do. We're gonna have to act for the joy of it, for the love of it. And once we learn to do that, 
there is tremendous freedom. <laughs> tremendous freedom. It's all alive. It's all connected. It's all intelligent. It's all relatives. A revolution of healing coming from the heart of nature. Improving the environment by changing the world. To love all the children of all species for all time. Nature and spirit, it's all connected. To find out more about the work and writings of Matthew Fox, Michael Lerner, Johanna Macy, and all of the participants in this series, the annual Bioneers Conference, and membership information, call the Collective Heritage Institute toll-free at 1-877-246-6337. That's 1-877-BIONEER. Or visit the Bioneers website at bioneers.org. To read more in-depth tales of other Bioneers, check out the book and resource guide, The Bioneers, The Declaration of Interdependence by Kenny Osabel, available through The Bioneers or at your local bookstore. To order a cassette tape of this program using your credit card, call 1-800-388-8273. That's 1-800-388-TAPE. And please specify the program number. To receive a complimentary copy of the New Dimensions newsletter, please write to New Dimensions Radio, Post Office Box 569, Ukiah. That's U-K-I-A-H, California, 95482. You can find us on the web at newdimensions.org. The Bioneers, Revolution from the Heart of Nature, is a production of New Dimensions Radio, distribution by the New Dimensions Broadcasting Network. Executive producer, Michael Toms. Producer, Neil Harvey. Managing producer, Justine Willis-Toms. Recording engineer and mastering, Catherine Vibert. Assistant to the executive producer, Bet Kagiyama. Writers, Neil Harvey and Michael Toms. Our theme music is taken from the album, Journey Between, by Baca Beyond and used by permission of Hannibal Records, a Riker disc label. A list of all the music appearing in this series can be found at newdimensions.org. Portions of the script for this program were drawn from the work of Kenny Osabel. The opinions expressed in the Bioneers radio series are those of the commentators and not necessarily those of the funders, the Collective Heritage Institute, or New Dimensions Radio. Special thanks to Kenny Osabel, Nina Simons, Ginny McGinn, Kelly Webster, Wendy O'Dai, and Rosie Ward at the Collective Heritage Institute. Rose Holland, Joni Springer, Dave Drysdale, Suzanne Kenny, and Christina Fleming at New Dimensions. Ron Sunsinger at Sunsinger Sound, and to Conference Recording Services, Richard Page for Conference Recordings. My name is Michael Toms. On behalf of everyone at the New Dimensions Broadcasting Network, I'm wishing you well. This is program number 2925.